welcome this is Darius Aria for the American Institute for Roman Culture and Ancient Rome Live today. The topic is the mob, riots, and the people of Rome. So the people of Rome, the, the Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Populus Romanus, was a powerful entity in Rome, always, and their presence was felt daily in the assemblies and in voting. And of course, we know through the written sources, they could be fomented, they could be unruly, they could be driven to violence due to uh, political crises, due to uh, famines, due to their observations of there being uh, injustices. And uh, let's take a close look at the mechanics of riots and violence in ancient Rome. So first of all, let's talk about who's doing the rioting. Okay, so there could be a lot of people uh, that would be rioting, but one of the biggest uh, groups we'll focus on is the people of Rome. And of course you have this term, the plebs, the plebeians, the commoners, the kind of non-elite. And there are a whole bunch of ways that a lot of the senatorial um, historians describe them as unruly, as sordid, as common, as riffraff, as ignorant. So not a lot of nice uh, terms here. But the thing is that you're really applying this to this group of people when things go wrong. Because obviously these are the same group of people, massive people, that are going to be going to the various assemblies and ultimately voting for things uh, that are being uh, put up in, uh, you know, for deliberation in various uh, places of voting in the forum, uh, in the Sycta in the Circus Maximus, actually in the, uh, in the, in the Campus Martius. So you really have, uh, the, the real issue is when they're not behaving, when they're doing things, when they've taken, a, you know, they have a mind of their own. So that's what we really want to talk about. And explicitly, we can go right to the beginning of the early Republic when we're going to have the voice of the people heard several times. There are fa five famous walkouts where essentially the whole population from 494 BC through to the end in 287 BC, in five occasions, they're leaving. They're withdrawing from the city limits because they're not satisfied. They're not getting their basic needs met. And how do you meet their needs? Well, then the senatorial class form a 10 man board to address their concerns and create a legal code known as the 12 tables. But even that is not going to be enough to establish and guarantee, and I call them exactly inalienable rights, but basically to set up a mo more coherent and clear, clearly stated uh, declaration of what's expected and what the, what the protections are in legal cases for the everyman, as it were. And in the end, so we're talking about walkouts, we're not talking about real violence, but, but think about that. When you secede from that union of your city, uh, that's a big deal. And if you're the bulk of the population, you know, the body versus the head, as the Senate like to think of itself as the head, then you've, you've got no city. So the ultimate, ultimate, uh, conclusion of that long uh, period of withdrawn on and on again, off again, uh, all the way to 287 is the creation of the Lex Portensia that established that a plebeian led assembly. The plebiscite was binding to all citizens, including that upper class, that patrician class. And that was supposed to be the end of that real cry of there's a disparity, there's an unevenness, an unfairness uh, in the system. And that really does, for the Romans, close a door on that ongoing conflict. Think about that, 494 BC to 287 BC. That's a long chunk of time. But obviously that's uh, in, within our, I think our categorization and conversation today, about how that large body, that large assembly of people organizing themselves 
not officially, but saying we need to exert our own ideas, our own principles, and we're willing to go to an extreme measure, which was, in this case, not going to war, but, or not sacking the city, but simply leaving the city. Basically, we're out of here, we're going to do our own thing. And then it's being enticed back, no, no, you can do this, you can do that, you can have that quality, and you can come back, and they did. So that's one point uh, to look at. See, there's a any questions, put them in the chat. And then let's jump over to, I'm just gonna do this rapidly. Uh, let's jump over to the Gracchi, because here's another period of reform. And, uh, and uh, really, uh, it's where you have a key issue. Rome has been acquiring a lot of land through conquest, and that land becomes public land, ager publicus. And the issue is that by this time, all those Roman citizens that are fighting, they're fighting and fighting and fighting, but there's a land requirement. You had to have property to serve in the military. And ultimately, there be, a lot of the Romans are becoming, you know, people of the city, the Erps. This grand idea of Rome is growing. You're there, you're not tending your fields, you're losing your land, and now at a certain point, I mean, how can you even serve in the military? So this, Radical idea is to give a lot of that land that belonged to the state through conquest and parcel it out to the people. There are two brothers that are involved in this, and they serve as tribunes of the plebs between 133 BC and about 121 BC. There's Tiberius and there's Gracchus. And I have a professor when I was uh, TAing in a graduate school class, and he said always, think about them like JFK and RFK, two reformers they had horrible ends. So you already know what's gonna to happen to Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. They're gonna push through reforms, but ultimately they're gonna be killed. And when they're killed, they're gonna be killed by the mob. And where's this mob coming from? So uh, in the first case for Tiberius, it's uh, basically, um, in, well, in both cases, Tiberius and Gaius, the issue is these individuals are overstepping their bounds, which they did. And ultimately, the idea is pushed out that these guys don't want to relinquish their power, don't want to end their time in office, and ultimately are, are trying to re regain the status of kingship. They want to become kings, they want to be autocrats, and that's one way where you can foment a lot of people in the public to get rid of them. And that's what's going to happen. So about 300 uh, men go over and club uh, Tiberius and his supporters uh, to death. Or uh, Tiberius and 300 of his supporters are clubbed to death. So that's, a, that's an awful way uh, to go. Uh, later on, uh, Gaius is pushing even more reform, giving more, trying to give more support to the people. And ultimately, he is going to be... Uh, forced to commit suicide. So his you know, end is near and he's committing suicide in the, uh, on the Aventine Hill. And, and in each of these cases, unfortunately, it's, you think about when you're looking at it, how else could these ideas have been solved? You know, coming in to the assemblies and addressing these issues, having fears allayed and so on and so forth. But so much so was the, let's say, radicalization or the the, the large agenda that was pushed by these two reformers, there was a lot of pushback from what you can call the establishment, uh, from the members of the Senate, and didn't like what was going on in this assembly. This is the same assembly of the plebs that we talked about initially, where that large mass of the general population says, we need more recognition, we need more of our own voice. Eventually, by 287 BC, they get that voice with their own um, uh, Concilium Plebis, their own uh, assembly of the plebs, and now within that system, looking forward into 133 and 121 to 121 BC, you have two reformers that are going to push that situation even further, trying to uh, change grain laws, trying to continue to enforce uh, more, uh, you know, wealth, more power to the average person, and there's just going to be a lot of pushback in that. And, um, you know, again, it's, you know, it's not, it's not an organized military that's curtailing 
these men's ambitions or drive. It's a lot of people within the public are organized rather quickly to stop an imminent threat. Okay, so why are people, why are people rioting? Why are people fomenting? Um, so initially we're talking about its representation. Um, and of course, we're talking about also uh, this idea of uh, pushing the, into the area of the autocrat. That's going to happen time and time again. Uh, and the Romans, we just have to think of names like Marius, Sulla, uh, Pompey, Julius Caesar, and uh, Octavian, and Mark Antony. So that's going to be a big one. What about food? Food is going to be a big one as well. One of the major concerns, the well-being of the Romans, this mega city, this consumer city, is that it's dependent upon huge amounts of grain imports. So therefore, if there's a chance of famine, or if there is a famine, then the people will get riled up and activate, right? And so whoever's in power is going to be out of power if they can't solve that issue of a food shortage. Uh, there's taxes, the people are complaining about their safety, uh, such as uh, after the fire of 64, people are plenty mad because the city has burnt down, they're looking for someone to, to blame. Okay, where, where are they fomenting? Where are they, uh, where are they protesting? So right behind me, there's the Roman Forum. Uh, of course, you've probably heard that term, bread and circuses. Uh, if you think about how ultimately under the emperors, you have that situation of the uh, people of Rome, um, you know, not being able to vote anymore under the emperors, where do they complain? Well, they're going to complain in big public venues like the circus. They're also going to want their entertainment. Uh, they're going to want to be, you know, have to pacify them. Uh, but they definitely want their bread. They want the handouts. They want what's guaranteed to them as Roman citizens. Uh, ultimately, grain is going to be subsidized and then handed out once a month to the citizens of Rome. It's a big deal. Do not mess that up. Make sure you have both of those two mechanisms in place. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. And people will be protesting in places like where a lot of people can assemble. So a circus, an amphitheater, a theater, the stadium. Okay. And you also have uh, you know, places of concern where there are the assemblies where you're going to be voting. And that can be the forum. It can be the Circus Flaminius. <clears throat> it can be the uh, Cycta. And uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, upheavals. In particular, we can focus on the uh, Republic. And we can focus on a lot of issues that are taking place. Yep, and we'll, yeah, and we'll, we'll get to food uses a power play as in halting shipments of grain to Rome. Yeah, we will, we will definitely get there. We're definitely going to carry, carry into, the, uh, into the grain issue, which is always going to be a big factor, kind of one of the Achilles heels of, uh, of Imperial Rome. But let's think first for a second of the gangs. I always think about the gangs of New York, but the gangs of Clodius and Milo in the 50s BC. Uh, let's think of the... The impact then even earlier with Sulla marching in the city and leaving his guys in charge of the city uh, while he goes off to fight in the east and come back. Well, in the meantime, there's a lot of rioting and ultimately uh, fighting. And uh, let's think of the Catalinian conspiracy and the people that he's rounded up to try to overtake Rome. And then he's going to be summarily executed and his followers executed by Cicero. A little bit of a no-no because there was no due process. That's why Cicero himself gets exiled. But ultimately, in all these situations, we're having masses of people that are, are participating. Uh, again, with a lot of piracy in the 70s, uh, Pompey the Great is then sent out to rid the Mediterranean of the pirates. But already then, you had um, the, uh, the reality of uh, that the grain shortage always hanging over the Romans. So it's a really volatile period. Uh, in the last 50 years of the Republic, but we can even go back a little sooner, and we have the Servile Wars from about 101 BC all the way down to Spartacus, uh, and you have the Social War um, in the in the 80s when the Italians are fighting for citizenship and things come to a, a boil. But within all these different famous circumstances, you have unrest within the city itself, and the people are going to be exerting in their own way, their voice, not always under the lead of some 
patrician or direction of some tribune, but even just willful amongst themselves. When Julius Caesar famously was assassinated uh, and, and, well, he wasn't supposed to be cremated in uh, the Roman Forum right behind me there, you can see in the distance, the remains of the temple of divine Julius Caesar, but it's there that the people gathered and made a funerary pyre of benches and whatever they could find and cremated that body right there in the form itself that was eventually uh, succeeded by there being uh, a column marking the spot and then finally the temple built between 42 and 29 BC. So that was not orchestrated by Mark Antony, it was not orchestrated by anybody, it was something that spontaneously was uh, put into action. And uh, it's, it's, it's incredible, but so many times we read about this and read about the unruliness uh, within the city, but of course it's within a very, very volatile period of time. So let me turn here to a couple of points then as well um, to, to keep in mind that when we do have, it's all said and done, and we have the calm, let's say relatively speaking, of Augustus, we're going to have a big change, which is you're going to have outside the city, the Praetorian Guard, and then you're going to have an urban police force like there was never before seen in Rome. And we're talking about a total of 12,000 soldiers, 9,000 for the emperor and 3,000 under the urban prefect. And that number will change a little bit, bumped up by Caligula, even more by Claudius. Then Vespasian brings it back to 9,000. And, and now up to 4,000 within the uh, urban police force, the urban prefect. And then finally it stabilizes at 10,000 Praetorian guards uh, for the emperor from Domitian and onward, and 4,000 for the urban prefect. Then keep in mind that under Augustus, there are the vigiles, the kind of fire police force department. And there are 7,000 of these guys distributed in 14 regions. So. I mean, it's, it just becomes a pretty, you know, impressive amount of manpower, of, of force, if you want to think about what's going around the world today or what's happening right now in the United States with a lot of protests, with a lot of police enforcement, the National Guard is being called out in a lot of states. Think about that kind of situation. Think about Rome now, and we're talking about 12, we're talking over 20,000 soldiers the Vigiles kind of soldiers, but you know, they're freedmen, but they're still acting as part of that police enforcement. If you consider 20,000 for a population of a million at any given time, they're there. And the encampment is created. The Castro Pretoria is actually built as a stable structure that's eventually incorporated into the Iranianic wall circuit that's put in by uh, Tiberius. So we'll go through a couple of instances in the imperial period. Let me read you a real famous passage from Tacitus. Tacitus says, hey, in AD 32, there was this resolution about a problem with the grain supply. A lot of people weren't happy with the resolution, so there were protests that broke out in the theater. Protests directed to the emperor. And they were, got more and more outspoken than usual, says Tacitus. The emperor is really mad, so he's looking around for someone to blame. He blames the magistrates and the Senate because they haven't kept the common people, the plebs, in check with the authority invested in them as public servants. Then he also made it clear from what province he was bringing in grain and how much greater an amount he was bringing in than his predecessor Augustus had. So you can see this kind of response. Hey, 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 I'm gonna show you very clearly. Here's the shipment, it's larger, it's better, everything's gonna be okay. So the emperors had to step in because the Senate wasn't doing its job in his opinion. Gotta blame somebody. Many, and then in 51 AD, a shortage of grain and the resulting famine resulted in prodigies. And the complaints of the people were not kept low or private. Instead, they surrounded the emperor Claudius with angry clamoring. When he was in court hearing cases, they pushed and shoved him roughly to the very edge of the forum. He escaped the hostile mob only with the help of a band of soldiers. And I think there also one passage says they're pelting him with old crusty breadcrumbs, you know, just crusts of bread they're throwing at him. It's a pretty nasty situation here. And um, this again is. You can just imagine, you know, a couple of troops are holding off the big throng of people so he can escape and go back up to the Palatine Palace. 
I mean, really, you know, touch and go here. And there are many, many examples of this. Uh, let me just uh, remind you of a couple, or if you're not so familiar with them, just, uh, you know, inform you, and then you can go and check out the sources. I mean, all these things will be ultimately on Ancient Rome Live. There's a dedicated page per uh, lecture, webinar with bibliography and so forth, and places to go and books to buy and so on. 41 BC, a big bread riot in Rome. Why? Well, it's all, all about Octavian and Mark Antony trying to get along in 41 BC, but then there's a blockade. Who's keeping the grain from coming in from Sicily? A pirate by the name of Sextus Pompey. Not really a pirate, but he's the son of Pompey the Great, and he kind of took over at that point. Uh, Sicily, which was the breadbasket before Egypt, and he's stopping the grain coming into Rome. And it's so nasty in the streets. There's a big riot, and Octavian himself is injured. I mean, he could have been killed. Okay, here's another example. AD, and I'll get to your questions in just a second. AD 19, what happens? Germanicus dies. He's the heir of Tiberius. The people were so distraught because they really liked this guy. They did not really like Tiberius. There's rioting in the streets. A lot of property damage, a lot of just anguish. Uh, people were really mad. What are we going to do now? Who's going to be the person we really like this guy that's going to succeed Tiberius that we really don't like? Let's pause here and look at some questions such as, when the protests are triggered by the plagues, objecting to any restrictions of movement, food, trade, etc. You know, I can't think off the top of my head right now of protests per se associated with the plague, with the Antonine Plague. It's really about all this hardship that Rome undergoes because so many people are dying and not so much that people are protesting. Ah, here, here uh, Robert says, New York City has uh, 36,000 cops. Wow, okay, that puts it into perspective, right? I mean, look at that, 20,000, 20,000 in a given day. We're not even talking cops here. We're talking, we are talking uh, uh, military. We're talking the troops. So it's even a little more daunting, I would say, than even like the, the, just the vigiles uh, kind, of, uh, kind of attitude or you know, kind of you know, definition of, of, of uh, who's protecting the emperor. Please put the Cassandra of the Vigilates and the Pyramid of Cestius on your list of places to take us to. Uh, absolutely. Cassandra of the Vigilates is closed right now. It's on Tristavide. It's a great site. Um, where are times in other cities that there were riots? Jerusalem had unrest, but not because of food, other food riots elsewhere. Absolutely. Uh, we could, uh, there are zillions of examples of, of riots and unrest. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, the Romans will send the troops in. The governor has to exert his authority and so forth. The Judea is obviously going to be one of the hot spots, but there are tons of hot spots. Uh, Alexandria. And then we get into the Christian era. Think about all the violence and the, and, and the mob that would go to a particular place, the famous sacking of the temple of Serapis in Alexandria, kind of the end of Christian, the, the end of pagan worship of the, of the deities. Oh yeah, that there's, there, there are books and books and books written on this and, and we'll share all that with you uh, ultimately. Okay, so just kind of wrapping up. Um, so the death of Gaius, the Senate wants to restore its own power, right? Go back to being a republic, but it's the mob along with the Praetorian Guard that push for somebody to replace uh, Gaius Caligula, and that's going to be uh, Claudius. But if you look at the at the sources, if you look at your Tacitus, Antonius, and so forth, there is a big part, a big role that's being played, not just by the big famous power brokers like the Praetorian Guard or some members of the Senate or family members of the Emperor, or, you know, Praetorian Guard head, the prefect but also it's the people themselves. They're in the streets. Hey, the emperor's dead. We didn't like that guy. He's assassinated. What's happening next? Give us another ruler. We like these rulers. They give us, they subsidize a lot of stuff. They give us a lot of great entertainment. They take care of us. They're looking out for us. And that is exerted several times. Uh, the death of the emperor Pertinax, for example. I'm jumping forward here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, you know, grain hoarding in part and, and the upping of the cost of grain is what also ultimately leads to the revolt against Nero. Um, and people are getting mad at him. With the fire of 64, he blames the Christians. So that, you know, so the mob isn't coming after him. Uh, and again, the death of, of Pertinax ultimately 
his title uh, is going to be auctioned off in the forum, the people did not like that. The people did not like that at all, uh, and they're going to exert their uh, displeasure. So we have many, many examples of, of the mob and violence. We know how large the crowds could be. We know the venues and how uh, always the authorities were very much concerned with building permanent structures. Uh, for a long time, the theaters in the Republican period were only made of wood. They were not permanent. They were only for temporary uh, festivals. Uh, of course, we know that the first stone amphitheater is only built with an emperor. That's under Augustus. That's built by Stilius Taurus and so forth. So, we, you know, there, there's places that become associated with those kind of groups of people that assembly that assemble and can potentially be dangerous um, and have their own ideas that aren't going to be really directed by the authorities and members of the Senate and so forth. And we see that historically then uh, the, the tribunes of the plebs are also going to be very powerful people speaking to uh, the masses. Ultimately, the real conversation is between the people in the circus up to the emperor and the palace on the Palatine Hill. And there are all kinds of conversations that are going on between all those masses and that individual. So just a little taste of these issues, a little taste of the Senate and the people of Rome, that is the people of Rome of SPQR. Very important to keep in mind how volatile their situation could be. Remember, Rome was crowded, Rome was complicated, Rome was ultimately uh, a dangerous place, and you wanted to have those basic assurances, and if you didn't get them, you didn't have the, the food guaranteed to you, it wasn't showing up, or the, there's a spike in prices, then that's when things could all get loose, or you have the assassination of an emperor and the, the succession wasn't clear, they could then, quote unquote, step in. So those are just some ideas and insights on uh, our conversation today, on mobs and violence and a, a lot of the uh, difficulties in the city of Rome. And they are very good. Uh, I'm looking at a whole bunch of other uh, issues here, a lot of questions, but definitely it's a, just address them as we wrap up. Food absolutely is a major source of unrest because it was much less of a guarantee, let's say, than in a modern city today. Uh, but we all know around the world, so many people have a very unsure uh, you know, food supply reality. Uh, and it's dramatic to a lot of people around the world, many, many people. So we also want to think, even though, hey, we're talking about Rome, this incredible empire and all this great wealth, and, but you know, it was actually much more volatile there that this food security, which affects so many people around the world, it affected Rome too. It was, it was of the utmost uh, you know, priority uh, of the Senate and then under the emperor. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a, it's, it is a very, I think it is a timely lecture. That's really what I wanted to do it as soon as possible, uh, given how the state of the world right now. Uh, the, the riot outside the amphitheater in Pompeii, yeah, that's, that's another uh, conversation, but essentially it's a riot that breaks out during an amphitheater, uh, gladiator fights, Nocera versus the Pompeians, and uh, all hell broke loose, and you've got a fantastic painting. I wanted that personally to be my back, backdrop uh, shot for today, even though it's not in Rome, and I couldn't find it in my, my archives. But it has a great, great uh, kind of conversation. So listen, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for all your time. Please do consider uh, subscribing to the newsletter and following us uh, all the time every week. We have new videos dropping. This week's on Friday was uh, the uh, Forum Piazza. Please do consider getting uh, involved and supporting us. You can go right there. Uh, to ancientromelive.org slash donate to support us. We're looking to fulfill at the end of this month uh, this uh, goal of $1,000 of support that's earmarked uh, for 12 months of the year. We're just over halfway uh, to meeting our goal, so we're going to push really hard for that. We thank you for your consideration, and we thank you for tuning in every Sunday, and then you can also join me on Wednesdays on location. Have a great weekend.